Welcome back, everyone, to the Friday edition of Sports Call. Sports Call brought to you by Always Money. At this time, we want to go to the phone lines and welcome in a special guest, George Schroeder, National College football writer for the USA Today. George, thank you so much for being part of the program. Sure, glad to be on. Well, George, uh, it, a lot of uh, teams starting camp today. Some started yesterday and throughout the week. Uh, but we are officially here, and uh, I said earlier in the show, it's kind of like a kid at Christmas. You've got so many people tweeting different things from different camps. Uh, they can't get off of one subject before they go to the next. I said it's like having a bunch of Christmas presents. You get one halfway opened, and you can't stand it anymore, and you got to go over and open another one. Yeah, I feel that way for sure, and, and obviously we're still, oh, depending on how you count it, 27 or 28 days away. I, I'm going to be fortunate enough to be, covering a game that Thursday night on the 28th and uh, looking forward to it. But opening camps is a really cool deal. In fact, it is the calendar's finally turned to August. You know it's finally here and are about to be here. And Steve Spurrier called it what we've just been through, the talking season. And it's nice <laughs> It's nice that we're, you know, at least they're sort of, they're all running the Oklahoma drill now and getting ready to, and getting ready for their first game. So that's kind of cool. George, we're in the first year of the playoff, and, uh, you know, for so long, so many of us uh, wanted this to happen. So we are here, and a, a committee of individuals that were chosen will decide the teams that get into the 14 playoff. And I've heard so much talk about uh, schedule strength and, and why do teams want to go out and outside of their conference and get other tough teams. And uh, we talked about it earlier in the show, when that committee – finally rewards a team with two or three losses over a team with one loss or no losses because they played a much tougher schedule, then you'll start to see people go, okay, it's cool to go out and get uh, some of these tougher teams. And a lot of conferences are jockeying to where you cannot go out and get uh, out of you know uh, out of your division opponents anymore. They're trying to make it to where the fans, when they show up, the all the games are, are important and, and, and big money games. So your thoughts on that, George? Well, I think a couple things. One, we don't really know what the committee is going to think, but it's very possible that over the next few years we're going to experience kind of a paradigm shift in what makes a successful season. It's, I don't think it's ever going to be like the NFL where you make the playoffs at 8-8 eight and eight or 9-7 and seven or whatever, and obviously they don't, college teams don't play that many games. But I think sort of there in the past we have seen the deal is if you go 12-0 and 0, uh, or 13-0 and 0, as the case may be, um, you've had a great season. If you go 10-2, and two, which is kind of what you would do, you probably wouldn't play in a conference title game at that point, then it's, and it's been a good year but not quite as good. I think we may come to a point where that's not as important anymore, even in our minds, as sort of fans of the game and those who follow college football. That said, it's going to, be, it's going to take a while to adjust to that. And I'm not sure the committee's there yet as far as that goes. But schedule strength is going to be a big deal, and it's – and we can debate the, the various strengths of different conferences. Some are, some are more equal than others. Uh, but, by the way, some of the schedules within a conference are, are better than others. You know, there's, uh, you know there, there are teams that have avoided the best teams in the other division of conferences sometimes, not on purpose, just the way it worked out, and that makes it easier to have a, a better record. Um, but I think the committee is going to end up rewarding people who play, and I don't mean intended to play, but who play – a, a legitimately tough non-conference schedule. doesn't mean all of them have to be tough. doesn't mean, uh, you know, there won't be some cream puffs. But that, I don't think this sort of intent to schedule thing is really going to take hold because uh, I'll give you one example. Oklahoma's got Tennessee on the schedule this year. That's a great name game. But I don't think any of us think Tennessee is back yet. And the intent there is to schedule a marquee game. And maybe when they make the return trip to Knoxville, Tennessee will be back, and that will be a big deal for Oklahoma. I'm not convinced that's a giant deal for Oklahoma. On the other hand, they're playing nine games. They're playing everybody in their own, everybody in their own league. And I think that's a big deal. So, I mean, we can play this strength of schedule thing one way or the other, depending on who you know. It, it's going to be a lot like anything else. Whoever you think ought to be in there, you're going to have the argument that seems to fit. George, I think it's going to be interesting as we get closer to uh, the end of the season. I know we're just starting. We're already talking about the end of the season. Uh, but yeah. when we get down to the end of the season, who is going to be that fifth team? And uh, you know somebody's going to be left out of that 14 playoff. Now, here in Auburn country, 
we've talked about 2004 for forever, and that was the one year that kind of got the BCS on the outs, especially here in the SEC, because Auburn ran the table, couldn't jump uh, Southern Cal and Oklahoma, uh, but never had a shot to see if they could have won a national championship. But this is always going to be, no matter what system you have, somebody going to be left out. If you had an eight-team playoff, who's that ninth team? So it's going to be interesting to see who is that team yeah. on the outside looking in. I agree with that. Now, I'm not one of those guys that wants an eight-team playoff. Uh, I think it's probably coming uh, at some point. Probably not as soon as some people think it will, but I think it's coming. And I'm not one of those that likes it. But I think when you get to eight, I don't think not the ninth-place team is going to be as big a deal. I really don't. Um, I think four and five – is going to be a bigger argument than two and three ever was in the BCS. I really do. I think I think that who's number four, who's number five debate, and sometimes who's number six and why aren't they number four is going to be a huge, huge deal many years. Now, you know, maybe the committee will be blessed and there'll be kind of a pretty clear, you know, uh, line of demarcation after four this year. But a lot of times there's not going to be that. And there's going to be serious pressure on them uh, every year because you've got five power conference champions and in many years they all have you know uh, one loss if you have one with two or there's somebody that's not like the others that's that's a different deal but in many years they all have one loss and maybe a couple of them are undefeated which one are you going to leave out it's, you know, it's that's going to be a big deal every year you're leaving one out every so often and not 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 more often than not but every so often you may leave two out have two in from one league or another. I don't. I think that's much less likely to happen most years than than it is. Then I just don't think we'll see it happen as often as people think they will because you're already leaving one power conference champion out. So it is going to be an unbelievable controversy uh, many years. I think. I, I think you're right, George. And uh, you know the BCS had its issues with some of the. Uh, the rating systems that they use to come up with a formula to choose the top two teams. But for the most part, they got it right year in and year out. Now you're you're adding in uh, more of a human element, more of an objective point of view, and, uh, again, probably more controversy year in and year out because you, you and I know both that when you're dealing with four to five teams, there's not going to be that definitive line. Four and five are probably going to be pretty close, like you said, and it's going to be tough, a very tough decision for them to figure out. And is it going to boil down to a situation where the SEC has a potential of getting two teams or any other conference having two teams in there, and they go, well, we're just tired of that. We don't want to have two teams from the same conference. We're going to bump one of them out to get another team represented from another conference. Well, I think that very well could happen. And, and let me just say this. I, I, I do think it, it's much less likely that you're going to find a conference, SEC, Pac-12, that'd be the two you'd look at this year, or anybody else getting two teams in most years. I think you're going to find four power conference champions most years. It would take some conference champions with two losses or that, you know, some unexpected team wins a conference's uh, championship. Uh, you know, uh, a, a three-loss Iowa wins the Big Ten or something like that. Uh, to, to sort of knock out a second um, uh, power conference champion. All that, and here's the other thing I would say, too, is if you're looking at four and five and they look the same to you, right, and you're the committee, this is what they're supposed to do. If those two teams look very similar and it's a tough call and one of them is a conference champion and the other one's not, conference champ is supposed to be the tiebreaker so that to me makes it harder from their own stated criteria for them to go get two teams from one conference now having said that we'll probably have a goofy year and there'll be two <laughs> teams from one conference i know how this works but it, as i study how they're supposed to do it and if if things sort of go uh you know at, to form winning a conference championship is going to mean something to them now Maybe they look at that number four and five team, one of them's a conference champion, one of them's not, and they go, you know, that's great, that's a conference champion, but I don't see them being as good as that team that didn't win his conference for whatever reason. In that case, then you don't get to that tiebreaker. But if they get but if they're like teams, the tiebreaker is supposed to be conference champions. It's all good uh good interesting points and uh uh, you know, this this past year in the Iron Bowl, Alabama had not lost. Auburn beats them. They're sitting there yep. at, at, with one loss. Auburn goes on to win the national – I mean, goes on to win the SEC championship against Missouri. 
And that, to me, uh, everybody said, well, if we'd had the four-team playoff this year, Alabama and Auburn both would have made it in. So you're, you're right. I, it's it's going to be dependent on how that team with one loss and it's not a conference champion is sitting there. Were they number one in the country and get knocked off toward the end of the season? Uh, one more thing, uh, George, before we let you go, uh, uh, the, the, the coaches poll was released here in SEC country. Uh, again, staying with Alabama and Auburn, Alabama 2, Auburn 5. But the SEC, seven teams in the top 20, uh, showing that, that strength again. And the SEC West alone has LSU, Texas A&M, Ole Miss, Auburn, and Alabama all ranked in the top 20. Unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, now, let me just say this. I've got some issues with some teams that are ranked in the poll. We'll start with Texas at number 24, which I think was a helmet pick by the coaches. Just toss them in there. And I actually think Texas A&M is an odd pick. I do, too. At this point. I think uh, this is a rebuilding year for Kevin Sumlin. And I don't know where they go from here because there's going to be some open question as to whether or not it was lightning in a bottle with Johnny Manziel or not. And I, and I like Kevin. He's a good coach, and I think they're going to get it done. They've definitely recruited. But they're at least a year away from sort of their classes, their recruiting, recruiting classes taking hold. So, so – uh, on the one, I actually think I might not have voted for Texas A&M. The good news is, um, this is my standard disclaimer, even though USA Today sponsors that poll, I don't vote. That's why they call it the coaches poll. So, you know, direct your ire at those guys. They're the ones that disrespected your team, you know. But um, I, I do think this. Everybody understands that the SEC is really good. Uh, you know, that they half of their 14 teams are in there. Uh, half of the Pac-12's 12 teams are in there. Those are far and away the two best leagues, top to bottom, and they're and they they're both fairly deep. And so I think it's going to be really interesting to see how things play out. And I'll say one other thing too about the poll: Florida State. I think that's a team everybody ought to have ranked number one. They bring back almost everybody, including Jameis Winston, who's you know a fairly important player. I think when you look at the rest of the the, the sort of the teams that we look up uh, at up there in that sock six or seven, there are pretty significant questions about all those teams. Alabama, Auburn, Oklahoma, you, you, you name it. Uh, Oregon, I can give you the reasons why they shouldn't be there. I can pick them, each one of them apart. Now, they all got significant strengths, too. It's why they're there. But I can give you the worst-case scenario on all of them, and it's, and it's kind of interesting. It's going to be who answers those questions. Well, George, we really appreciate it. Before I let you go, I'm not going to let you off the hook. Who's your top four when the dust settles at the end of the season? I'm gonna go Florida State because of their uh, because of what they got coming back, but as much as that because of their scheduling. Now I think their biggest problem, and this could be a big one, is complacency. And Alabama has seen that over the last couple of years. It's hard to maintain that edge. Uh, and I'll let me leave the SEC pick for last. I, I think you're looking at uh, Oregon. I think you're looking at a Michigan State. Although I know Ohio State sort of the flavor du jour, I, I like Michigan State. I like Michigan State too, George. Yeah, this is just me about to be dead wrong on all this, by the way. So I understand this. I'm just throwing, pulling this stuff out of a hat. And then for the fourth team, not not necessarily the fourth seed, but the fourth team coming out of the SEC, you know, I, let me go the other side. I'm going to I'm going to give Steve Furrier the nod this time. I'm wow. going to go with South Carolina, and I do that as much as anything else because I, I understand that. Um, if I say Auburn, that's great. If I say Alabama, that's great. And that, that I might get in big trouble with fans of, of either school. So I think it's more likely to be Auburn or Alabama. But I think it's time for the SEC East to put one out there. And, and it could be Steve Spurrier's time to get it going. So maybe not the right answer, but um, the SEC champion will have every chance to win the whole thing, as usual. Well, George, uh, we're going to look forward to it. And uh, we really appreciate you taking time out to be on our program uh, this afternoon. We look forward to talking to you again soon. Yeah, you guys give me a call. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Thank you, George. That's George Schroeder, National College Football Writer for the USA Today. And, again, we thank him for taking time out to be on the program.